Welcome to TaxSale Insiders, the latest from TaxSale Resources, bringing you information about tax sales from experts in the industry. We recently interviewed Stephen Morrell of Juristeed, who has been instrumental in the statute changes for the state of Louisiana and knows everything there is to know about tax sales in his great state. So sit back and relax for another episode of Tax Cell Insiders, powered by Tax Cell Resources. Welcome to this uh, section of uh, Tax Cell Insiders. We're here with Stephen Morrell. Welcome, Stephen. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, Stephen, I think I was trying to think back of when you and I met. I believe it. I was at a conference in, uh, I'm, I might butcher this, Nolens uh, back in uh, 2012. Um, so we've known each other for a long time. Um, I know you've been, uh, Stephen's been absolutely pivotal in, for over the past 15 years in um, shaping the tax industry in Louisiana um, to what it is today, and then even more pivotal in what uh, direction it's going. Um, Stephen, I won't take your thunder, um, but I'll, so I'll let you kind of tell us a little bit more about your background. So um, yeah, like I said, tell, us, tell us all the stuff in the tax industry you've been, you've been tackling over the last 15 years. Well, first off, uh, not bad on the your Nolans uh, enunciation. <laughs> I've heard far worse. So, all right, all right. <laughs> yeah. so I can tell you've been there a couple of times. Uh, but yeah, it has. We have known each other for a long time, and it's it's been. Uh, it's, I'm glad you have me on the show, and and this is. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be able to share uh, what uh, experience has been in Louisiana and kind of where we are now. Um, for personally, my my background, um, I'm a, uh, an attorney, been practicing for about 18 years and uh, fell into real estate law pretty early on in my career um, with just a fascination of real estate. And then um, sort of happenstance fell into the tax sale world um, as clients were trying to get title insurance on tax sales and having the darndest time. <laughs> you mean um, you, didn't, you didn't have aspirations of getting in the tax sale industry as a kid? Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> I didn't know what the heck a tax sale was. So that seems uh, to be the so, biggest uh, biggest question at at conferences is how how do you get into this industry because it's it's so niche, uh, fairly unknown at least as of, of today, and everyone seems to to fall into it. So uh, another victim of falling into the tax sale industry. Yeah, it's it's usually it has to be a unique story because there isn't like a real conventional way to fall into the industry. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, I I just left the, the big firm um, uh, of, you know, right out of law school, everyone tries to get a big firm job. And, and, I, and I had one for a, a few years and, and then was going out on my own uh, with, a, with a, a title company. And uh, when you go on your, on your own and you don't have any clients, you learn to say yes a lot. Um, uh, yes, I do that. <laughs> and so um, it just so happened that uh, people started walking in the door a couple of times with tax sales and saying, of course, my answer was yes. And so. Um, but I found it very interesting. Um, I found it, I was just really intrigued by it. It's not something I was familiar with before. Um, and then it became uh, where I was the tax sale guy. I was the, the one that, that the other attorneys and the, the title companies uh, were looking at doing more of a volume approach to their business uh, would start referring cases over to me. And, and so it just sort of kind of ended up doubling down on it. And um, Eventually, um, as, as you pointed out, we met probably back in 2012 or 11, whatever that was, but uh, uh, got associated with the MTLA and, and, and got associated with the, um, the, the state legislature has a, a body called the Law Institute, which is an academic um, and a practical um, organization of, uh, of experts that uh, are formed to help advise the legislature on prospective changes to the law. Uh, it's really a smart way to, to go about considering potential legal changes because the legislature has limited time and ability and, uh, to consider those types of major changes to the law. And uh, this gives um, our state the opportunity to have a well thought through researched um, uh, proposal 
uh, for very specific subject matters. I was added on to the Louisiana Tax Sale Committee for the Law Institute in 2014 and have been a member of that ever since. Um, and it's through that organization that I've been able to contribute to um, analyzing Louisiana's tax sale system as it, as it was and it is now and proposing uh, several more legal changes that uh, at this point in time, we're hoping will become come to fruition sometime in 2021. Awesome, awesome. Now I, I did, um, um, I read through your white paper here. Um, if for anybody on that uh, needs some very good reading, reading on uh, how Louisiana tax sales work, um, highly recommend it. But anyway, believe it or not, I did do my homework a little bit, Stephen. Um, and you guess you mentioned, um, it sounds like a, a new venture you're involved with called uh, Jurisdeed, correct? That's right. That's right. Uh, tell us a little bit about, about that. So Jurisdeed is a uh, creation that is a, um, something I've been wanting to do for a long time. Um, I just recently, at the end of last year, left a position that I held for the previous five years, which was Chief Legal Officer for Civic Source. Um, and Civic Source is a company that's handling uh, government tax sale due diligence through technology. Um, and uh, I had uh, you know, partnered with them at a private practice to help sell the government held tax deeds with title insurance, which had never been done before. Um, that went really well. Uh, we had a great uh, um, uh, tenure with them and uh, it was time to move on to do something else. Um, what I had wanted to to uh, to do in the past, and I was able to to have now have the opportunity to do, which was to create something that benefits the um, the investors of tax sales, not just the government, but also the um, it is a benefit to the system of analyzing tax sale titles uh, to really crack this uninsurable code, and that and everybody has been dealing with this since I mean really since the first time I got into the business, it was it was already an established problem, and it's never not become a problem. It's, it's how do we get um, at, on a on a regular basis? How do we get title insurance, and how do we make this of a more of an insurable risk for underwriters? Um, and is it more of just a perception of risk rather than an actual risk? You know, what are we really afraid of, and and, and why is it that uh, that the industry is still fighting with this? And if you ask uh, some of our you know colleagues in the association, uh, the NCLA or the other uh, circles. And you ask them what the number, their number one, uh, you know, gripe is about the industry. They'll probably tell you if they have anything to do with tax deeds, it's mm -hmm. titles over and over again, merchantable titles. And so, uh, there, there's a there's a, a need there, and and I and I recognize that. And it's in in you know with the tax deed properties owned by government, um, getting title insurance on something that people thought was uninsurable was the goal. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have been down that road before and, and was fortunate to have a lot of success with it and uh, wanted to really, um, you know, um, double down on that and, 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 and see if we can expand that concept of, of mitigating the risk in a, in a more systematic way and through education and through legislation and, and by, by bringing people together to have a better appreciation of the risk. They can understand how it is an insurable risk if you do it right. Um, and the the other aspect of uh, what Juristeed is going to become um, is to make it more accessible, make it more attainable, and more financially possible for more people to actually go through that process. Because as you know, um, you know, trying to clear title and hiring attorneys and going into court and it's a long process usually. Mm -hmm. It's expensive. As a matter of fact, it's expensive and you don't even know how much you're going to spend. You get into yeah. it and you hope you don't have to spend much, but then you throw your hat into the litigation ring and you never know what you're going to get. Um, you know, it, attorneys have uh, unfortunately really held on to the past of not embracing technology that benefits the clients. Um, and clients don't really have a choice, right? You either get the legal services or you don't get the legal services. And that's unfortunate as the rest of a lot of many other industries have really um, embraced the um, the, uh, you know, tech, technology to really benefit the consumer. And, um, and that's something that I believe is, is absolutely attainable with the legal practice. And a perfect start to it is in something like real estate, which already has embraced modern technology in many other aspects, such as financing and, and marketing and sales 
and yet this big segment of legal is just sort of still held back and they're holding themselves back. So we intend to really buck that system right. and, and kind of shake, shake that industry up and, and bring a new technology platform that will be, it will speed the process up of clearing title that will make it more insurable, more marketable, and will will create a, a more attainable and, and financially feasible system for people to uh, to get clear title and legal services with fixed fees and, and predictable uh, uh, um, costs and much, much, much more expedited process of getting to that end result, which for the tax deed investor is to liquidate that asset with clear title, is to be able to get rid of it, get in and get out, and not be stuck with it and not have a, a harder time selling that property and having to reduce the price because it's got a negative stigma to it on the title. Um, and, uh, and, and that's really the, that, that whole system um, is, is possible to be done by leveraging modern technology if you embrace it. And that's what Juris is all about is really taking it. We're not inventing new technology. We're, we're, take, we're finally taking a step towards embracing what's already out there and bringing it to market to benefit this, this particular industry. And that's, that's our goal. Awesome. Awesome. So you're, um, I mean, essentially you're bringing the process of getting clear title on tax, you know, say tax deed REO properties um, into the 21st century, right? Through, through technology, but not new, nothing new. It's, it's just utilizing existing technology and processes that are already out there. Is that right? And I'm probably being a little more modest than, than I should be. Uh, you know, if my uh, uh, marketing <laughs> strategy is hearing me say this, should probably be smacking me over the head because I'm not selling it. But, you know, no, it, it, look, it's exciting. It, it's, uh, and, sure. and we've done a, a tremendous amount of research and have talked to most of the, of the, uh, of the, the large uh, hedge funds and investors across the country and have, have uh, asked about their pain points and have talked through it and have really tried to design this system to be exactly what fits the biggest, to solve the biggest problem that they have. And, and honestly, it's, it's, look, we have all this data out there. Why can't we have an insurable, clear title, a title commitment with, a, with an insurance company that's already pre-approved it in minutes? Right. I mean, really, sir, why not? Um, you know, the, all, most of the of the of the data that it's based upon is in the public records or right. it's in easily researchable data. So let's put some rules together. Let's let, let's go tap into that and let's just put it all together. And, you know, we don't have to be si you know, attorneys are siloed by their licensure. Right. I mean, you have every state license their own attorneys and the larger investment firms are not so regimented, right? They're not so, um, they can, they can invest in and typically do invest in multiple states. Right. And, you know, right now that typically requires them to hire multiple different attorneys, one for each state and that they all, each attorney charges a different set of fees, has different, different work product, different work process. And, and that unfortunately gets a lot of inconsistency and efficiency to the investors side of things. Um, right. And, and so, you know, Another new bucking the system kind of kind of uh, mentality for providing these services, both in the legal and title world, is to have a consolidated platform and, and, and a, a single venue to go obtain all these services, regardless of where they're provided. And you probably have seen other places like Rocket Lawyer and LegalZoom and, and who are attempting to get into that, who are getting into that type of environment where the consumer can just go to one place and it doesn't matter where they're coming from, right? They need a will or they need a document or they need advice and the system will place them with the correct attorney to do the right thing in that locale because they've already worked all that out, right? They have this right. network of pre-vetted, experienced, ready to go, available, all that good stuff and, and they're connecting them. With Juristeed, we're going to have a network of experienced tax sale attorneys. We're going to bring, that's going to be part of the process. And so for the first time ever, you'll be able to come to a single place for all title and legal that tax sale investor needs to get all the way to the end, no matter where the property is located. And that's, that's going to be a huge efficiency to the investors who do invest in multiple different states. Um, it will be a consistent product, the same price, the same end result, the same um, quality, same turnaround time, Everything will be consistent product going out the door. 
and all of the interworkings, the, the network and the connectivity will be will be something that the company will already have done for the investor. Wow. Well, that'll be amazing. I mean, like you said, there's a, a litany of, of issues that come along with solving cleared title. But, you know, the two biggest ones is is the ability to get financing. Right. It's the ability to, um, you know, leverage that asset, um, which that can be just from the real estate investor, but also, you know, the, the tax lien investor, um, you know, large institutional guys. I know there, there's a lot of of uh, restrictions around, you know, the REO they can take on quantity, et cetera, because of all of those title issues. So it'll be, it'll be amazing. So I guess, when are you, when are you hoping to have that um, service kind of up and running in a, in a beta capacity, Stephen? Yeah. Uh, and, and actually we'll be looking for some, some beta testers too. So we're, um, we, we have um, a pretty comprehensive marketing campaign that we're that we're assembling right now um, that will start putting uh, some of these feelers out there, reaching out to uh, those in the industry who are interested in becoming part of the beta testing and and to, to seeing how this could benefit and bring value to their 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 portfolios. Um, we're hoping to have that available sometime in the fall of, of this year. So within the, which isn't that far away because we're now at the uh, right about yeah. August. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've already started uh, coding um, our platform uh, and creating, uh, it, there will be a finished product for the consumer. There'll be a, a, a well-developed UI and UX um, uh, for the uh, end user to, to log into and have a, have a, have a, you know, a, a, a client portal, excuse me. Um, but we're hoping to have at least the inner workings of that uh, to, be, um, to be testable um, sometime later this fall. And our uh, our launch uh, date that we're that we're shooting for is early March of next year, um, okay. where, where we could literally take it to market and open the doors and, and see how many people we can help. March twenty twenty one. Yeah, that'll be that'll be here before we know it. Oh yeah, <laughs> how yeah. fast this year has gone by. And that's that's for sure. Um, all right. Well, uh, let's dive into Louisiana tax sales. Um, and I think the the burning question um, on most people's minds, e even after you do your research and read the statutes, is okay. Is it a is Louisiana tax lien state or tax deed state? And why like why is that so confusing? Yeah, that's actually why I wanted to lead off the paper with that because I'm I'm well aware that that is the that's part of the confusion. Uh, and so you'll you'll note by if you uh, do get into the the paper really early on. I try to slap the reader in the face with that question right away uh, because it's the burning question, right? What is Louisiana? Uh, it, it, I mean, we've been called many things, um, and it's you know, is it a hybrid? Is it a redeemable deed? Is it a, you know, if you know these terms, uh, you know, you know that it's uh, only a handful of options out there. But uh, honestly, the biggest one is just we're just confused, you know. So, um, you know, historically, Louisiana was a, uh, a talking you know a long time ago was a, a, a property foreclosure state um where it was, it was a forfeiture state excuse me not a foreclosure state and where you would just literally just lose your property you know if you didn't uh, after a certain time um <laughs> you know the, the 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 bill of rights came out uh thankfully and uh and, and curtailed the uh the, those kinds of practices by the government uh, without due process uh and um you know the um the states louisiana has a history of sort of Take, you know, not being the first in line for many good things, and, and they eventually get around, except for having fun and uh, having great food. Yes, uh, yes, but, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> but, Orleans uh, is great for good food and good fun. That's for sure. That's for sure. Uh, so eventually, the state, um, you know, wised up and, and, and changed to a uh, what we now know to be a redeemable deed type system. And this, so we're talking about the the, uh, the turn of the, of the 20th century. Um, uh, and that essentially said that the, the the tax collector who in Louisiana is the sheriff uh, for the parish taxes. Now there's there's separate municipalities who have their own in, inner collections for city and local tax, you know, more local tax than uh, than on the parish level, and and those the city tax collectors could in fact collect separately from the parish. But for the most part, the, the biggest taxes, the larger amounts, and uh, you know, of course, our our counties are called parishes. Of course, another another way that we're unique. Um, <laughs> because of our, our you know French and Spanish heritage uh, or and, and our uniqueness you know, coming out of that world um, in is being civil law state uh, but it's Napoleonic code and you know uh, those kind of differences so um, the um, 
the the system eventually uh, really stayed in place. The redeemable deed was was the way it, it went for a long, long time. Um, and it wasn't until 2009, um, wow. over a hundred years later, um, that we the Louisiana saw a significant change in what kind of tax sale system we have. Um, and um, a lot of people don't even know this because it wasn't really that broadcasted. And to be honest with you, it was a statutory change. Uh, wasn't in the Constitution, um, which I'll get into later. Was created a little bit of problem, but. Um, the, you know, the, uh, what, what the investors see is the result, the product of the law at the time that the tax sale occurs. Right. But, um, you know, we talked about changing the law. It's, it's a, it's, it's a substantive legal change. So it doesn't apply retroactively. So basically in 2009, as tax sales began being sold from 2009 forward, that's where the new law applied, but that really wouldn't affect the court proceeding until years later. And so for, you know, three, four, five, six, seven years post legal change, it, it changed some, some things substantively, like at, 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 the, at the tax collector level and at the, uh, you know, maybe the, the actual tax debtor level. But it didn't really change a whole lot for the investor who is handling the tax deeds for many years after the change um, because of how long it takes to eventually work its way through the court system. And then ultimately, you need that new court decision, right? You need that 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 pinnacle Supreme Court case to come out and say, uh, "You did it right. You know, you you got it. You got it right." And so, even after the law has really settled in uh, on a on a practice level, um, you may not have that case yet. And for the reason why I'm mentioning all that is because um, you know, on the title insurance industry really relies heavily on the court system to guide them and and and, and for good reason um, you know but to really make the the those who evaluate what insurance risk they want to take remember those are private businesses but most of the time they're they are relying upon the standard of practice of law in that state and that's typically set in stone once you have well settled case law um, and that starts from the from the Supreme Court so you know, to get a case all the way up to the Supreme Court, you got to have the right set of facts, you got to have the right parties, you got to have someone paying for it, you got to have, you know, so it, it basically, it wasn't, yeah, it is, it just is what it is, right? So, so I mean, the, the law changed in 09, but it wasn't until uh, 2017 oh, wow. that, that we saw a, a really good case that, that finally made it up to the Supreme Court, and finally the Supreme Court said, you got it right, Louisiana. You did it right. Finally, you did it right. And and as a matter of fact, this system pretty much rocks. Like the y'all did a good job with this. Uh, it, it it it's good. And so um, then, of course, that realization has to sort of sink into the business world, right? To, to like the the mm -hmm. right. Did, has anyone taken note of that? Has anyone said, okay, um, uh, now it really has changed. I can go invest in Louisiana now. Or have the title insurance companies seen that and said? Um, okay, yeah, uh, let's go insure those because we know we're covered now. The risk is not nearly what we thought it used to be. Uh, and of course, that takes time too. <laughs> so uh, here we are in 2020, uh, and it's finally starting to sink in. Got it, got it. So what, um, I want to dive back into that but real quick. So, you know, the, the Supreme Court, Louisiana Supreme Court said, okay, uh, Louisiana, you got it right, but you had mentioned you know some changes in statutes coming in 2021. Are those changes um, are they the same level of significance or impact to where it's you know it's going to be another couple decades before those are really I guess implemented fully through a court case, or uh, I guess what changes are coming out of that, um, or, or hopefully coming out of of that next iteration that may affect what's what's currently happening. So the, the, no, they should happen much faster. And the reason is because I don't think we'll need uh, case law to provide the, the, uh, uh, the assurances of the future changes we're talking about, like we did for the, for the 2009 changes. Okay. Um, 2009 changes affected due process. Um, and, and obviously that's a legal concept and mm -hmm. starts at, at the federal level and um, is not something that someone can say objectively due process was met or not, right? That's not an object, that's a subjective decision that's typically made by the courts. And so you have to re really rely on the judiciary for them to say, 
this this something that was previously unanimously deemed to be a lack of due process now has it. You know, we've met that standard of due process. The changes coming up and in, in that, that we we haven't even spoken specifically about what they are, but the ones that are coming out in, in 2021, hopefully, are more process changes um, that were really left out of the 09 statutes. Um, okay. and, and really, it, you know, I'm, I kind of think of it as the icing on the cake. Um, I think that the system that we developed in 09, although it took a while for it to sink in and become the standard, um, was the most substantive change that the state has and will see. Um, I think that from a practical standpoint, and as it impacts probably many of your listeners, uh, investors, uh, et cetera, I think the, the ones that are coming out in 2021 are going to be more obvious of, of a change. Um, you know, and for example, uh, the, the, the number one component of Louisiana tax sale, the, the, the tax sale system that everyone's uh, probably highlights that definition of why it's confusing and complicated is the way that we conduct the tax sale competition. Um, you know, you have, what I mean by that is you have, you have bid up premium states, you know, how, how do you, how does Stephen and Brian compete at the tax sale? Who wins, right? right. Um, you can bid down the, the, the percentage penalty in some places of the interest rate, et cetera. Um, Louisiana has the, 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 the worst one. Uh, and <laughs> it's just, it, it's, it, look, it's, it, it is, it is what it is. And, and that's why we're changing it. It, it better late than never. Right. It's right. a, it, and it's a bid down of percentage of ownership in the collateral property that you would take if it doesn't redeem, if the lien doesn't redeem. Right. Um, and, and so, and, and like, you might want to replay that and say it again, because it's like, wait a minute, say it again. Um, I mean, it, it's, <laughs> It's that nuts, uh, and, and it's based upon uh, at least uh, the, the research that we've done into this. Uh, if you really cared to know, was when more agrarian society, and you had big lot swaths of farmland, and you know you had a hundred acres, and you had a, a ten dollar tax bill. It's like okay, we'll just take one of my acres. You know, really, you don't need to take the whole property. Um, and that was sort of like the concept in that. Um, and uh, and there was a lot more um, you know acceptability of, of co ownership, um, I, I guess, but. Um, bidding down the ownership percentage uh, is does not mean that it's you're you're dead in the water. Um, it, as as the system is now, as kooky as it is now, and as much as we want to change it, the you know I've been had an opportunity to advise clients over the years, and and there have been companies that have done very well in Louisiana embracing that system. And in fact, once you get over the complexity of it and the comprehension of it. The fact that it is complicated kind of keeps the competition out. To be honest with you, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, the confusion, the confusion is limited competition. Uh, um, yeah, it, definitely. Um, I've seen that. I just I want to want to kind of reiterate a couple things that you've hinted on and just make it sure. very clear. Like you said, is is in two thousand nine is when they really changed from what was a redeemable deed to now uh, a tax lien. Statute. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And then as far as the, uh, I guess to add to the confusion, the way you bid at the auction is a bid down of ownership percentage, right? Which probably adds to people confusing it with a tax deed. Um, but as you stated, the only time that ever takes, that ever goes into effect is is when that property doesn't redeem, right? So the only time you're really even dealing with that piece of the puzzle, if you will, is that small percentage of, of the few that end up not redeeming at the very end. And then you got to figure out, um, you know, the foreclosure process, which we'll get into in a little bit. Right. But the, the bid down itself that isn't saying anything other than if you get to that stage and that few percent, right, then that's what you're willing to take as ownership at that point in time. Is that that's right? Okay. That's All right. Absolutely. absolutely fair. Down there. Yeah, no, you, you got it. You, you, uh, you got it down. Um, and, and so, you know, whether that means something to you or not is, is a personal, is an investment decision, you know, um, and looking at statistics, um, you know, Louisiana follows pretty much the statistics of most states as far as redemption rates. Um, Louisiana has a very long redemption period of three years as the standard um, that can be reduced to 18 months if the property is, is can be proven to be blighted or abandoned at, at the time of the tax sale. Uh, another just you know, um, another trick of the trade a little bit. Um, but, um, you know, three years of the standard, and that's a lot of time for someone to, to, to redeem. Um, it's, we're going to shorten that in the upcoming uh, set, um, revision. Um, and um, oh, 
the, yeah, I think for good reason. Um, it, it's we're going to shorten it. To, it should be closer to about two years. Um, okay. And um, you know what we find is that redemptions you typically are are, uh, are really lumped into the right, right right in the beginning of the redemption period and right at the end of the redemption period. Right, everybody's like, oh my god, it just happened. Let me go pay this off. And people are like, oh, well, what's the last day to pay? You know. And so typically people fall into one of the other two buckets. Yeah. Uh, which, means, which means dragging it out doesn't really bring a whole lot of value to the government or, or to or to the investment community, right? To get redeemed. So, right. um, um, but you want to have a, a long enough time for people, you know, those that need the time to get the money together to not lose their property, right? right. That's, that's hence the, the the reason why it's not, you know, thirty days. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, the the ownership interest uh, obviously has no bearing on your investment if lien redeems, right? I mean, it never came into play. It's kind of like the collateral for a lender in a mortgage that it didn't really matter if the if the, the borrower paid all, you know, and all of their payments and paid the loan off, then right. the collateral was irrelevant. It was, it's just security. And so having a percentage of the security is just as irrelevant as having all the security if you never need the security, right? right. Um, but it's really important if you do need security, it's important to know that you don't have the whole thing. And that's where it gets kooky, but it's obviously a very small percentage of cases. And I think the NCLA uh, recently put out a report that you know provided you know it's something less than one percent of all delinquent tax taxes across America on average that ultimately get foreclosed on. Right, right, very very small percentage. And so the 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 bid down ownership percentage obviously doesn't affect um, the interest that you're accruing on that lien. Uh, through the redemption period, what uh, what is the redemption in in Louisiana? What is the redemption rate? Or oh, sorry, the the interest. The interest rate. Rate. Um, so it's it's a one percent per month simple interest from the date of the sale okay. until, until redemption. Um, it's twelve percent a year. Yeah, it's twelve percent per year. Um, obviously, cumulatively, cumulatively over three years, that can add up to thirty six percent ignoring time value of money, et cetera. But uh, right. there's also then a 5% penalty that applies one time at the time of the sale. Um, the interest does not accumulate on top of the penalty, but they're just added back together when you come up with the redemption price. So this um, is an automatic at least five, and then basically you don't start increasing above that till month six. Do I understand that right? No, actually, so m month one, uh, if the uh, if the redemption occurred the date after the sale, you'd be getting right. your money back plus six percent. Plus six. Okay, so it doesn't. Right. So you get one. So how about month two? Is it seven or is it still six until? It would become seven percent total. So okay. get, five plus. obviously, the five percent penalty stays the same no matter what. That's a okay. So in addition to one percent per month, beginning of the, the month of the sale. Got it. Got it. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's it. So it ends up being really. Forty-one percent. Yeah. If, it, if, the, if, if the redemption happened on the last day of, or in the last month of the three years, right, um, it would be a total of forty-one percent, or seventeen percent in the first year. Right. Correct. Got exactly. It. Got it. Okay. What? Well, um, excellent. I guess uh, you mentioned the sheriff, right? Is the tax collector? Um, can you describe a little bit about how auctions actually work in Louisiana? Are they um, are they live? Are they online? Um, you know, is it uh, you know, you mentioned the the bid down percentage. It you know, is it the you know raise a paddle, you know, yell out whatever your percentage is. Um, I guess can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, and and, and again, just to clarify that the the sheriff is the collector for the parish taxes, and in many in many cities, especially the smaller ones, do have their own separate tax. Uh, well, they all have their separate tax collector, um, but have their separate tax sales as well. Um, okay, separate from the parish. Some of the larger cities have uh, cooperative endeavor agreements with the the sheriff, the parish, and the city to combine that collection effort once it falls delinquent, um, and and also sometimes when it goes to tax sale. So there's only one sale. Um, something to be to be uh, leery of um, on the investment side is are the jurisdictions, the city parishes where they are separated, um, because you can have obviously it's one piece of property even though it's two separate tax bills, right? One for the parish and one for the city. And if they're collected separately and they have separate tax sales in the same year, you could have two different investors having the same rights to the same property at the same time. Um, hmm. That is an all, also an awful system. And, and it, 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 that one is way more difficult to change. 
um, because any legislation that would attempt to make that simpler would be telling one of the two of them they can't collect tax the same way that the other one can. Um, and so in the tax sale is obviously part of the collection effort. Um, it would have to be something where everyone came together and said, look, I'm okay with giving up this right um, because it, 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 it makes sense that we consolidate the, the collection, the, the, at least the delinquent collection effort, right? Collect your own taxes for the 90 something percent that pay. But for the delinquent ones, let's consolidate this. And that's something that's on the table for the revision in 2021 as well. So those, um, you know, the, the city level and the county, or sorry, parish level, um, there's no precedence as to what has superiority over the other. They're basically the exact same and it's the same um, bidding auction process. Everything's identical. Well, there is there is precedent, and there there is a there is a, there are rules to tie break that. Um, um, but but the 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 procedure through which the tax collector of any kind, parish mm -hmm. or city, can can go through to then to collect is exactly the same. What the the result of the tax sale, the 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 the, the meaning of the tax certificate that the investor gets is exactly the same. Um, What's different is obviously if you're looking at, if you're trying to like say, okay, well, well, in my scenario where I said, you, you know, you might have in the same year on the same property, a, a parish bill and a city bill. Well, who has the greater rights? Um, well, it, it's a, it's a, it's more of a public records um, type of analysis there. It's who got there first, right? Um, okay. it, it's where did it happen? You know, who recorded their, their tax certificate first? And then of course the date of recordation, just like public record law across anywhere is what really matters that date stamp by the clerk. Um, um, that being said, uh, you know, the, the remedy, the recourse for, uh, an investor who holds a single certificate in a property is to simply pay the taxes, right? Is to say is to pay or, or redeem a another, another interested party's tax sale, right? In right. the same property. If you want to preserve yours, you need to make sure that there are no other rights held by other people. That includes other tax sale investors. Um, so obviously the, that that weighs on the decision of the investor to pay subs and to pay other to pay subsequent taxes or to pay other municipalities. You know, um, so that's just the investment decision. But that but that's the risk you take if you don't if you don't pay it is right. you could lose your interest to somebody else even in the same year. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Now, is there um, you mentioned the redemption period being three years? Is do liens in Louisiana expire after any period of time, or do they? They do not, uh, and that is also something slated for the, the the 2021 changes. That's not great for public policy, right? Um, saying that, hey, we, we we appreciate you giving the government your investment dollars so that we can operate this year, um, but go do whatever you want with this property after this. Like, there's no time limit for you to enforce it. I mean, what happens is obviously things change, investors their their interests change or the property changes, and there's no there's no there's no uh, consequences. You know, they can take forever. So literally no statute of limitations at all to enforce your lien rights. Um, okay. and, and that's that's going to change for sure um, because everyone is benefited by having a deadline to, uh, to uh, where you would lose your lien rights if you don't take steps to perfect your title or to or go through certain procedures to notify interested parties by a certain time. Got it. Okay. So it's, it, is, it is opposite of states like Florida where – and most investors can ignore any you know delinquent taxes that are more than seven years old because there's really no right um, to those lien holders after those seven years. Um, whereas in Louisiana, you still need to to make sure that you account for those older taxes in your I'll call total exposure, which you're going to have to make sure if, if you want to reserve your interest in that property, like you said, you're going to have to take care of all delinquent taxes back to beginning of time, essentially. Well, you just you just uh, opened a little bit of Pandora's box with that question. Uh oh, so, uh oh. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll put that back in the box. You might want to put that one back in the box. Yeah. That's, uh, it, it yeah. really, what, and and I'll and I'll re I'll sum up why. But uh, you know what what I was referring to to your previous question was more about the the the, the right uh, or an obligation of, of someone who's already bought a tax lien or property to eventually, if it doesn't redeem, have to take steps to enforce that, to convert it to a deed, to foreclose, or, you know, the process. Um, th that's an important time deadline that we don't currently have and need to add in there so that the investors are motivated to push the, because what happens is the property suffers, right? right. 
the property gets abandoned and the best sometimes the best thing that could ever happen to that property its chances for being returned to commerce is that investor and if they're not motivated to do it though of course they're not also not motivated to lose money so they're just going to walk away from it and that hurts the community and everything so that's what i was referring to as far as a time deadline as far as the a limit on when or how old are the taxes that they have to pay if they let's say that they they, they get into a, a property by having a taxing certificate or as the, as the property owner there there's a there's there's a, a debate uh and there's some there's some conflicting case law and, and this is something that needs to be resolved uh and there's some different philosophies on this too um right now louisiana the anything older than three years cannot be taken to tax sale okay um but real estate taxes also have no statute of limitations like in other words the they're they don't go away they just can't be put into a tax sale but to make things even worse the supreme court has come out and said that the tax sale is the only way to collect tax building with tax excuse me so <laughs> You have you have the judiciary saying you must use the tax sale, and then you have statutory law saying, but if it's older than three years, you can't use the tax sale, and also saying in the Constitution that they never prescribe, they, 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 they never go away. It, it just doesn't. You can't put those three things in a bucket and have that bucket make sense. And so you just have this like, and it, so what? Unfortunately, what happens sometimes this is another thing for investors to be leery of in Louisiana right now is being. You know stuck with a bill uh an old bill of taxes because guess what it wasn't in the tax sale you know why because it can't be by law but yet then they go perfect their deed or the next year the tax worker sends out a new bill like in year two the year after the, the tax sale where the investor got into it and gets this regular this tax bill because the investor is entitled to get a copy of the, of the tax bill uh as a matter of fact right now it's sent to the investor whoever the the, the, the prevailing tax sale purchaser is they get the tax bill and has all these like like five ten years old of taxes they're due, hmm. and and they're and they're demanding payment and a lot and and then there's a lot of um of, of discretion given to the tax collector to how they decide they're going to accept payments. They might say you need to pay the oldest tax first. Well, you're like I'm not gonna do that. It's ten years old. Like I I, don't, I just want to pay the ones that are still within the three year period, right? Within right. the but they, but they they have a discretion to then to say no sorry I'm uh, first dollars in are going to go to the oldest taxes and we'll work towards the president well then guess what that does leads to unpaid tax bills leads to more yeah. uh, adjudicated properties you know and so the system just is broken in that sense um, the, what's be what's the, the the caution I give to my clients is to look it, what's your investment goal you know are you trying to get into this because you're trying to own property. That's probably not the greatest way to buy property, but if you but if you're okay with owning property uh, with the portion of your portfolio that, that does not redeem, um, if you're planning on paying subs, if you really care about protecting your you know the the growth of your interest, if you you're accumulating interest so it gets to that three year, then you need to be aware of the delinquent taxes on this property that are outside of the tax sale. Um, you need to just be aware of that. Maybe it doesn't hurt you. Maybe it's not a big deal. If they're owned by another lean investor, right? If there's a lien on it, that's obviously uh, much more urgent or you're going to have to satisfy that. Otherwise, even if they're older than three years, they still have the right to go through the foreclosure process, right? They've met that three-year redemption period. If there is no lien on those old taxes, sounds like it just varies by tax collector to tax collector on how that's handled, what they'll do. Um, but if there's no lien, then there's no foreclosability on those older taxes do i understand that correctly on the older ones they can't if it if it has not been sold already at a tax sale right um, it can't go into a tax sale now it, but but then the, the remember the first caveat we talked about was if it's already been sold at tax sale there's no time limit for when that investor can take it to foreclosure can take Correct. it to through it and in louisiana we haven't gotten there that, that I don't want to steal the thunder of your asking questions from me, but uh, <laughs> but but uh, you know that that's that there is a judicial and a non-judicial avenue to, to pick from to take a matured lien into through a foreclosure to get to a deed. Got it. Got it. 
Okay, so I, I think that answers, um, you know, really well, it, it, like you said, opens a little bit of a Pandora's box, but it does a lot to explain, um, you know, how the redemption period works, how, you know, what the expiration of those is, um, how the interaction between, you know, city versus parish level um, tax collection works. Um, and I'm, I'm learning a boatloads. This has been uh, amazing. Um, to kind of um, circle back a little bit on on exactly how the 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 auction process works. Um, so going back to the day of the auction, mm -hmm. uh, are they are they kind of are they online? Are they? Um, how, can you explain just a little bit how the sale actually functions? Sure. Yeah. Actually, Louisiana was one of the first states to permit online auctions at, at their tax sales. So um, all the way back to 2007 was the first year wow. that a tax sale was put online in Louisiana. And maybe it may be the first one. Um, I'm not sure. But uh, uh, this is, keep in mind, two years post Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and this was a tax sale that was held for the city of New Orleans. Um, it was created, uh, I, I, I think, a lot of it, the, the the motivation behind it was because of the um, the disaster that occurred from the hurricane and really scattering everything around and, and making it hard to 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 do regular business in, in New Orleans. Um, but the right stars aligned as well, you know, having having the permissibility in the law um, and the right parties in place to put to kick it off. Um, today, uh, you have a lot more, um, especially. In, in 2020, post COVID, you have a lot more that are that are hopping online. But uh, even before this year, um, I, I would say um, more than half are still offline. But um, you have a, a lot, most of the major municipalities and parishes with large municipalities are online. Um, okay. So the tax sale um, is uh, generally for most taxing authorities, um, say maybe some of the small cities is held once a year. Uh, typically, the tax sale season in Louisiana is going to be between April and August, um, although there are a few deviations from that. Typically, not going to have anything earlier than August because of some statutory uh, minimum time periods that have to pass. But some, but the there's no hard and fast date that, like in other states like Missouri, where it has to happen on a particular day across the state. Um, you know, you, you, the tax collector could essentially schedule their sale no earlier than, but almost whenever they want to after that. It's supposed to be as quickly as possible. But um, um, the uh, the tax sale process, um, you know, obviously it's online. Um, you know, you're, you're it's it's pretty standard. I mean, you're registering online with whoever the vendor is, and um, they, they usually will all publish their properties. Um, a month ahead of time at least and so you can do your research uh, early um, and the way that bidding works because of the uniqueness of Louisiana's biddable component uh, being ownership percentage um, you know the price advertised is exactly what you're going to pay uh, it can't go up so it's right. easy from a budgeting standpoint to go to know what you're going to spend the sale you can set a pretty hard and fast budget and know exactly what you're going to spend you're just not going to know if you're going to be the winner um, but you know, entering your bid is, is saying that you're willing to pay the advertised price for what percentage of ownership in the collateral, right? Um, and the opening bid at tax sale by law is is has to be 100, percent right? That it has to open right. at 100 by law. But the very next bid can be one percent. The very next bid, it, it's kind of like in Florida going to quarter point, right? It's it's the okay. it's the lowest common deno it's the denominator, the lowest possible uh, numerical factor that is to be used. Uh, you can't get, we're not going to go with less than 1% ownership. Okay. So, so there's no fractions, there's no zero. No, 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 no. Okay. no zero. <laughs> yeah, <wouldn't work. laughs> well, I guess that was going to be one of my questions, I guess. If, I guess you could technically get, yeah, it's interesting. You, you could take nothing, right? If it doesn't redeem, you're done. Um, right. But is no. that, Or is that even a possibility or do they, do collectors just stop at one? No, 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 they stop at one by law. Okay. So, so yeah, so one is as low as you can go. <laughs> um, uh, obviously, above 100 is not possible either mathematically. Right. So, uh, so uh, but you can, the, the very next bid can be 1% or you can, or anything in between. Um, as soon as the bidding hits 1% within the time period of the auction on any given property, the auction of that property is done. Whoever gets there first is the winner of that, of, of the, of buy, to buy the lien, has the right to buy the lien at the stated price with that 1% uh, as their 
potential ownership interest in the collateral, and the there's no more bidding at that point. Um, so is it like a, is it you know, for the electronic auctions or online auctions? It's a a, a random selection if multiple people put in one percent. Um, no, it's highly encouraged to have a very fast internet connection. <laughs> Even though it's an online, you don't you don't preset your bid. It's it's still done live, even though it's well, online. Well, it depends on the vendor. So so you know I, I'm familiar with obviously with Civic Source since I worked there uh, you know previously five years. But uh, and, and they and they rolled out a system um, recently to allow a uh, pre-entry of bids. But you can't submit the bid until the auction starts. Obviously, the auction start and end date is end time is very important to the integrity of the auction, but you can have it all, you know, geared up and ready to go. Um, especially if you're, if you're bidding on multiple properties, it's very helpful to get your bids entered in quickly once the auction does begin, right? To the auction begin and it's literally one at a time and you sit there and you, you submit your bid on each. It's it, well, it, 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 with the civic source system, you can enter them all at one time. Um, so well, if you've taken the time to enter, to preload what you will bid on each given property, um, when the auction begins, the auction begins at the same time for all properties in the sale. It's not a one property at a time kind of thing. So right. at, for example, 10 AM or whatever the start time is, um, you can click submit pre-entered bids and whatever you've entered in across all properties in that sale can be entered in at the same exact time. Um, so. You, that might be really good for you if you have if you beat everyone else to the punch. You might, with one click of a button, win a lot of properties all at one time. So you, uh, so if, as long as you're up um, at whatever time the auction begins, and you're the first person to submit your bids, everything that you have at one percent, you get. Even though fifty other people have preloaded their bids, it's the first to hit submit on the the time that the right. So it's the transmission of that data click. Uh, through the uh, through the internet into a civic source servers or through their, what you know I mean every provider has to have the same kind of system. I know that um, the civic source system tracks you know entries by the millisecond. So there's there's really no ties. It's just a matter of which one that the, that the uh, that the computer saw coming in the door first is the winner. Um, so uh, obviously the offline auctions are are the circus that you can imagine that they would be. Um, with, with, uh, no, my hand was up first. No, my no. Oh, well, she's kind of good looking, so I think that she went first. You know, so I, you know, that's uh, that's the old the old school method of of, uh, <laughs> of the in person auctions, and um, even some of those uh, uh, parishes that had held on to the live auction for a really long time, can't finally caved in this year uh, due to COVID. You know, so. Right. It's good. It's good to see that because it actually does bring a lot of fairness to, um, I mean, the system of, of sheriff's deputies selecting whose hands going up in the air. I mean, come on, it's just yeah. <laughs> right, no, right so, for abuse. Uh, so uh, have your fastest, fastest finger um, on that clicker on the, the the moment the auction opens. Right. So other than going down to one percent, which will which will immediately end the auction of that property when when the scheduled time of the auction concludes, then the, uh, whatever the highest percentage ownership, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, the lowest percentage ownership that has been, that has been bid other than 1% would become the winner, um, at the time of closure. Um, okay. there, uh, another, another nuance of the civic source auction is that they have a sliding close system, which is kind of unique. Um, and instead of having a hard and fast, time on a clock where the auction bidding stops, uh, say it's six o'clock PM, you know, whoever got that last click and which, which promotes bid sniping, you know, like on eBay, the last second somebody snaps and uh, they can't, their system is pretty, it's pretty good in that sense. You can't do that. Uh, any bids received in the last three minutes of the auction slide the end time out by three minutes. So just keep, which keeps going perpetually until there's three minutes, of no bidding activity, um, which just provides more time. Uh, it makes, it does, it brings more value from a, a financial standpoint on the, the deed auctions, because then you're talking about bidding the property up and more dollars means more money coming into the municipality. Right. Uh, whereas this is just more time for someone to enter a lower bid. Lower bid, okay. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll dive into the deeds a little bit. Um, I think that's a whole separate topic for another day. In yeah, the, in detail. But um, before we get to that, so I, I think we've covered pretty well as far as um, you know what Louisiana sales are all about. Um, how the sale occurs, what the redemption period looks like, how the ownership uh, bid uh, works, um, and how that doesn't affect 
anything during the redemption period. Um, so let's let's go back to at the end of that redemption period, and you've you've bid. Um, let, let's say we'll start and make it simple. You 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 got it at one hundred percent of ownership, right? Mm -hmm. Um, what what happens at the end of that redemption period? What is that foreclosure process? I'm assuming it's a foreclosure process. What does that look like uh, for those few liens or that small percentage that makes it to that point? Once it's hit the end of the, of the redemption period, um, the, the first of all, the government's out of it. They're, the redemptions during the redemption period are exclusively handled by the tax collector. Um, there's there's a, a obviously a, a calculation uh, provided by law of what that amount is and that the, the transfer exchange of money is handled by the collector 100% of the time. Um, so the investor's out of it at that point. But it, as soon as the redemption period ends, it's the exact opposite. It's the the collector is, is completely out of it. They won't look at it. They won't hear you come to the counter and ask for redemption price. They won't talk to you. They'll say, go talk to the tax and investor. Um, and so so at that point, obviously, the, the, the you know, the, it's it's an asset that that the investor can use to negotiate a payoff privately um, with with the, uh, the the person who's desire if, if there still is a person who's desiring to redeem um, that that lien it's it's not a legal redemption we just colloquially colloquially call it a redemption because that's having the effect of redemption right but essentially they're buying the property back at that point. Um, um, so, so that's that's one. The first thing that that can happen is that there can be a private workout with the with the tax lien investor. Um, if the if that's not happening, or or it, it, whether or the investor doesn't want to do that, um, then the there are two choices to pick from for the investor to pursue converting that lien to a deed. Um, one is a a non judicial process of completing a and this is guided by statute um, and they it starts actually during the redemption period so it's important to know that the if you are going to go down that road and many people do um, you need to be aware of it and during the redemption period to so start preparing for it then uh, there's a, a, round, a round of notifications um, and certain things that are timed that you need to take advantage of if you don't do that you are not necessarily out of the water, but you're in a much harder position to get that confirmed down the road. Um, but this non-judicial process, you never enter the court system. It is a non-judicial foreclosure. You are going to complete a set of due diligence, which is pretty typical to, to in most places that have such laws. You're gonna have to do a title search. You're gonna have to do, you know, look for the interested parties, look for the people that have an interest in this property, owners, lien holders, uh, mortgagees and identify where they are and provide them with the final notice, their right to, that to redeem, et cetera, and, uh, and then wait out a certain amount of time. Um, if the, it, you don't need to break, break out your calculator or anything here, but there are two, two different buckets of time. Uh, if it's, if the, basically if it's, if it's the time since the tax sale has been a minimum of three years, but not quite five years yet, it's basically if it's been between three and five, then the waiting period, once you've sent that round of notifications, is six months. You have to, once you've sent out the letters, right? You've sent out, you've already, you've already done your, re, your due diligence, you've found everybody who needs to be provided that notice, and you've sent out the letters. You have to say six months have passed. Basically, you're allowing time for them to come in and one more chance, right? One, let, let's, let's, let's buy this back. Um, and if that doesn't occur, then you can go into court and ask the court to say, look at this body of evidence from the, when the government first started collecting delinquent tax until it was sold at the tax sale and I bought it and the time period has run and I did all the due diligence steps required by law, six months have passed, no one else has come forward or I've done everything correctly. The law says I am now the owner of that property. And um, if you're doing the non-judicial route, you're simply encapsulating all that in an affidavit, right? In a, a notarized affidavit saying, I swear I did all those things exactly as it's supposed to be. The affidavit has, it, it's, it's, a, it's a form in the statute uh, that you have to fill out um, and follow and have it notarized and have all of your exhibits attached to it and file it in public records. And as a matter of statutory law, it says that makes you the owner or makes you, uh, gives you the right to terminate the interests of those people that you provided the notice to. Um, and that's an important distinction because 
you can there are, there can be many different types of interests in a property, right? You can have a, 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 you can have four people who co-own the property. You could have a mortgage company or a grass cutting lien, and everyone's entitled to the same rights of due process. And just because one person was afforded their right doesn't mean everybody was, right? And so one very important distinction of the 2009 law, which was very very uh, smart to put in there, was recognizing that one person may lose their rights and another person may not. So uh, may may have their interest terminated in the, in the property. Um, if, if you if you can prove that you provided the, the requisite amount of effort to notify an interested party and document that in your affidavit and file that, then the law says that you have now terminated whatever rights they had in that property. Okay. Um, and so um, you know that that what often trips up investors at that stage, even attorneys, is that they don't uh, appreciate the fact that everyone has to be given the same amount of effort of due process, uh, which is the effort to provide them with notice. Of course, the key distinction is a common misconception is that is actual notice is not required um, in, in by any by any law <laughs> uh, in, at any level ever. Uh, and it's another thing I try to harp on in my in my paper um, because it's so commonly misunderstood um, and uh, it, and it, you know, it's just never been the standard of law at, at, in, in our country. Um, so it's all about establishing that the efforts you went through to provide these people with their required notice was reasonable, right? The effort was reasonable and you can demonstrate that and that is the standard. Uh, what we did in 09 was encapsulate that in their own state law and say that, okay, just show me that what you did um, was in what reasonable is obviously very subjective, but it's going to be measured by a court, maybe if it's ever challenged. Right. And so, I mean, whatever you think, you know, what would you do if you were really trying to get in hold of somebody? You probably wouldn't send one letter if it came back with a bad address is do nothing else. Right. That probably would not be considered reasonable. So it's just common sense. And, you know, now in, in 1983, when the Mennonite decision came out, we didn't have the internet, right? So using the internet would have been unreasonable, right? Because right. it wasn't there for you. Uh, <laughs> now, it's if you don't use the internet, it's completely unreasonable, right? So you, you know, reasonableness also evolves with time, and, and you have to evaluate it at, at the time that you're operating. So, um, and this is not a Louisiana principle. This is a, a United States of America principle, right? We're talking about the due process clause uh, of the Constitution. So, um, right. But but anyway, so so getting back to Louisiana though is is you're either going to pick that non-judicial route and establish all of everything you did to accomplish. Real quick before we dive into the judicial route, um, Stephen, you'd mentioned these um, notifications you've got to provide during the redemption period before yeah. that redemption period ends, and you said um, if you don't, you're not out of water, but it makes it harder. Is it is it a situation where those notifications just e extend that six months? So if you're late. In doing those notifications, you know, it, it the time clock doesn't really start until it's, that notification is done, or is it something different and and it just put it's more complicated than that, I guess. It, it unfortunately it is more complicated than that, and it's not as cut and dry. That and, and that is something we're trying to we will be addressing with the the next um, um, law change. Um, right now, it, it, the time frames are set out as what you should or must do, depending upon the, the law that's, that we're talking about, mm -hmm. um, but doesn't really explain the consequences if you don't. Okay. Um, the premise of the revision in 09 was that everyone's entitled to due process and that you can't possibly, under a constitutional law, you can't possibly terminate someone's right in real estate through a government-sponsored process without providing them with due process and due process means they were duly notified, right? They were pro reasonably efforts were made to, to notify them. So that's what we're talking about when we said due process in this kind of case. Um, so if you didn't provide that redemption period notice that you're, you're asking me about, but provided it to them after the redemption period and before you filed your suit, you didn't follow the statute, right? But you really had, it upheld the, the intent of the law. You, you upheld, you met the, the the key, the most important part of the law is to make sure that that person was provided with the right of due process before taking their property, right? The fact that it happened today rather than yesterday should be a, of no moment uh, if you actually did it, 
<laughs> right? So um, which, which one's more important to make sure it happened, right? That you did it within a certain time or that you did it. Um, and so, but, you know, I mean, statutes have consequences and timelines and deadlines have consequences. It's just the fact that Louisiana's current statutes don't really spell those out, um, um, but provide that really smart baseline, that really smart goal to hit, which is notify them. Make sure that you've notified them and you, you, you can never, ever terminate their rights without having proven that they were duly notified in Louisiana. And that's in the statute. So it's a self-protecting statute. So no matter how you interpret it, if either you did or you didn't, right, uh, provide that requisite notice. Right. So, right. you know, that being said, if you're a practitioner and you're an investor and you're doing this on a regular basis, I highly recommend that you follow the statute. <laughs> because yeah. why, give, why give the other side any, any kind of fodder to challenge you, right? So just do it correctly. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so there's, there's a time period uh, in, the, in the redemption periods, uh, 90 days prior to the end of redemption period, you want to send out a round of notifications uh, based upon title research to all interested parties and, and, and say, hey, guess what? In 90 days, this is coming up, right? You're about to lose your rights. And, uh, you know, so, um, and then, you know, post redemption period, you, that's when you make that choice. Are you going non-judicial or are you going judicial route? Got it, got it. Yeah, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt there, um, but I wanted to, that, that question was boring. Oh, that's, 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 that's a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so get back to, we, we went through the non-judicial route. So um, can you describe the judicial route if, how, if that's any different than the non, non-judicial route? It's it's significantly different for very, for several very important reasons. Number one is just from a prop procedure standpoint, right? You you need to hire a, a licensed attorney unless you're representing yourself and you uh, need to file a civil a ordinary civil action in in district court um for that is jurisdiction over the property that that is you know wherever its property is located um and um and you are going to need to have service of process so this is that the actual court you know like a foreclosure you have the sheriff go out and serve the copy of the petition and then the the citation to, to respond uh, and there'd be the regular rules of civil procedure would apply as if you were filing a lawsuit for a car accident like you know basically just regular procedure um so uh those have their own set of timelines uh, and and obviously it's good to have a uh experienced attorney that's representing you that knows that landscape um and um but there's also some nuances um that uh, apply only to tax sales. Um, and, and one of them is the time period to answer the suit by the defendant can actually be shortened to be a shorter time period than what the civil procedure laws require for all suits. So it actually can restrict it even further um, if the case has been, um, if it's been at least five years since the time of the tax sale. So it, so in other words, there's there's a little bit more of a motivation to, like, hey, it's been too long, let's speed this up. You know, let's, right. let's not wait. And, uh, and and that same that same uh, premise is captured in the 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 non judicial notifications that I, I mentioned that were six months. If when it hits that five year mark, so I mentioned if it's between three and five years, it's a six month period. Once it's it, the tax, um, it's been five years since the tax sale occurred, or when it was reported, the certificate. Uh, that six months is reduced to um, sixty days. So okay. significant reduction in time. Uh, you got to wait till you get five years to, to to take advantage of that, but it is that that is one notable change. Um, so, what going through the judicial process is is pretty similar to anything else. Um, you got you got to identify the interested parties as defendants, have them served. Uh, and, a, and a key question that often comes up, which is very relevant, is what if you can't find somebody, right? Uh, in the non-judicial route, it's well, let me show you how much I tried, right? In the judicial right. route, it's like, but they're not here. So, how do you move forward? And in most in most states, it's not unique to Louisiana. It has some kind of system for the court to appoint an independent uh, professional to stand in the place of the missing defendant. In Louisiana, it's called a curator. Uh, other common law states call it an attorney ad litem um, or something something of that nature. Nature. Mm -hmm. um, it's an independent uh, licensed attorney on the exist on a roster that the judge keeps, and they and they let them stand in the place of the missing defendant. And have their own attempt to locate them, which is, uh, you know, in theory, is unbiased and is uh, has one more attempt to find this person. If the curator can't find the person, and again, this is a very frequent occurrence to have a curator number one, and and, the, and that they don't find them number two, uh, mm -hmm. is uh, is you can move forward with your suit as if you had served them. 
that's a key understanding because people often are concerned who don't aren't familiar with that is if i can't find them then i'm dead in the water right i can't right. move my suit forward that's not the case you can move forward as long as you've gone through getting the curator appointed which is going to happen if you if you've said that you've already attempted to notify them if you've already had the sheriff try to serve them and everybody failed you're going to get a curator you're also going to pay for that curator but you're going to get a curator and um and uh, and and that can move let the case move forward Right. Um, obviously, it adds a little bit of time to the to the process of getting to the end, the end of the road, but um, but it is what it is. It's better than being uh, eliminated, right? Better than kicked out of the court. Absolutely. Um, um, once you've gotten to that point, um, if you have gotten service on on the actual defendants um, and they haven't responded, then again, civil process kicks in, and you can try to get a default judgment against them, which could bring a really early end to the suit, and that does happen more frequently than you might think. Um, I, for whatever reasons, you know, people are walked away and they just don't want to be worried about. But you found them, you served right. them, and they just said, you know, what you can have it. Um, and that that can happen fairly quickly. I mean, that I mean, that's if you've already passed up that 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 required waiting period, the six month or the sixty days, whichever one applies. Um, after they've been served, you have as as few as three days uh, to confirm a, a default judgment. Um, you know, so. Uh, after after you've taken the, uh, or reported them to have not answered timely, you can take it within three days later. So that's pretty quick. Um, yeah. Anyway, so so beyond beyond that, if if you did if you had if they if they answered the suit, they kicked they pushed the ball back, or if you got a curator, you're just going to have to uh, schedule a hearing with the court um, for a motion for summary judgment and and have and bring and bring all the head, bring it all to a head. The in Louisiana, the the tax certificate is is means a lot it, it means that there's a presumption in the law that everything was handled properly uh, okay. and it can be the burden is going to immediately shift um to the defendants to prove that something was not done right now here's a really key a really 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 important uh development from the 09 um uh, comprehensive uh law change that took a while for the courts to recognize because again remember the 09 change but the court matriculated into or evolved into, into a supreme court case of year if the notice wasn't given prior to the tax sale versus after the tax sale that was a that was the number one question now we're talking about the government right because we're talking about who's the actual tax sale the auction the, 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 there are rules on the, the tax collector to send out notifications prior to the even the auction occurs, right? You're, like, you're delinquent or you're about to go to sale, that kind of thing. Prior to the 09 law, because of what was recognized at the auction itself was the sale of property, that means that notice didn't happen before the sale of property, which is a, a blatant uh, violation of due process, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're only selling a lien, and not property, that's not a protected due process right, right? You're selling a debt. You're, I'm transferring the debt from me to you. You now are the debt collector. That's what happens at a tax lien sale. That's not a due process event, which means it's irrelevant if notice happened prior to it or after to it. Huh, okay. um, and so that's a key distinction. And this is, this is constitutional law, but this is also Louisiana now recognizing that that is what our law requires because the states can set up their own scheme, their own tax sale scheme to be whatever they want. And it's, all, it's a matter of this, the, the, the higher courts, the federal courts, to say that your state scheme is constitutional or it's not. Louisiana in 09 converted it to one that is. And in 2017, the Louisiana Supreme Court said that the first, and, and, it, and it, was a, it was a great case, it was um, um, this, the, the case citation of central, is, uh, central properties is how it's um, you know, quickly referred to now, uh, the central properties case, um, is that the first and only notice given to a particular interested party, which in this case was a mortgage company, happened after the tax sale. It was a, it was judicially admitted that there was no prior notice. And, and not only that, but the only notice that was given during the redemption period after the tax sale wasn't even given by the sheriff. It was given by the tax sale purchaser oh, wow. who had the foresight to, to, to take advantage of that redemption period notifications we talked about and prove that they did it. Now, the one last, one last really, really insightful aspect of that case, and this is really, really important. The statute says that during the redemption period, the sheriff must or shall send a post-sale notice, a, a, a nearing the end of the redemption period notice, excuse me, because there's two post-sale notices. There's one 
where the sheriff sends, but it just happened, right? This just went to tax sale, it's sold. And then there's nearing the end, like the 90 day prior to the end of the redemption period. Well, the statute says they have to do it, but like other parts of the law, it doesn't really say what happens if they don't. But most people will recognize the difference between shall and may in statute, right? That's a, that's a really common distinction in, 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 in civil law. Um, the same statute that says the sheriff shall says the investor, the tax law purchaser may do so. They choose to do it. So in other words, there should be some consequence if the sheriff doesn't, right? And there right. shouldn't be consequences if the investor doesn't. Well, in this case, the only notice not only happened after the tax sale, but was provided by the optional tax sale purchaser and was not provided by the mandatory sheriff. Wow. The Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of that tax sale because it happened. The notice happened. And that's the key takeaway. And that's how that's how Louisiana got it right. That's how we know that they, we finally figured out that we have designed a statutory scheme that precludes a violation of due process. Because wow. if, if neither party, if neither sheriff nor the investor did it, it's statutorily prohibited that that interest can be terminated. It can't happen, right? But so while they recognize the fact that yes, a, a shall do something was violated, that that is a, what's called a, a correctable mistake. Like, okay, yes, you're right. It should have. And we, and the, the legislature said they shall because they probably really wanted it to happen. And it didn't happen. So shame on you. But what are the consequences of that? Right? Um, well, since the the other people took it upon themselves to voluntarily provide actual good notice to the, that same party, then no harm, no foul. Right? Their, their biggest obstacle was due process. And it, it was met. Right? The person who would be would lose their due process rights was given due process timely and by someone. And that's what was the key takeaway. Got it. Wow. Interesting. So what, um, so whether it's a judicial or non-judicial route, um, I guess the only thing that matters is the fact that, um, you know, they go through one of those two processes, but there's no secondary tax deed auction or anything like that as part of either of those processes. Is that accurate? They're, right, it's not like Florida where you're gonna have a separate government auction to for the lien holders to foreclose and, and to, to put into another another auction their lien. Um, yeah. it, it's whether they, they opt in or opt out for con, uh, converting their own lien. Um, yeah. it's, so so another another advantage of, of you know of being the winner at the Louisiana tax lien sale is it it you know uh, secures your rights for that lien moving forward into forever. Right until right. You, until until it's time to do something else with it. Got it. Now, is there um, is there any sort of precedence or anything that says you know going the judicial versus the non judicial route is better from a, a title insurance perspective? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I, I kind of hinted at that there was other other um, distinctions between the two um, that makes judicial better, and that is definitely one of them. Um, it's this is you know my, my next statement is not an attack on the the concept of non-judicial foreclosure um obviously there are people who can do it better than the court system can um and at the end of the day if you follow the same logic as louisiana supreme court did in the central properties decision the due process was either had or it wasn't right and so you shouldn't need a court to tell you that due process was had you should just look at the evidence right and that's what the affidavit is that's what so it can certainly happen that being said, that's me talking in utopia, right? It's me talking in, and in, in I, I wish this was the case land and everybody, everybody just plays nicely together. And that's just not the case. Um, there's no question about it. And this is no, I think this is probably the, 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 the situation, the landscape almost anywhere you go. Title insurance wants there to be a judgment. Title insurance companies want there to be that, that shiny gold ticket signed by an elected person in a black robe with the gavel saying, I swear this was done correctly. And if I don't see that, I'm not insured, right? And that, and that, and that, that's, a, that's, a, that's just a baseline that the industry has, has uh, evolved into and it is what it is, you know? Um, uh, and unfortunately, there are also a lot of uh, other places where you see that distinction occurring, um, like safety and permits, um, you know, tax collectors, uh, assessors and other government officials who really are just 
in that it's either government approved or it's not government approved, right? And yeah, okay, the, it's government because it's the legislature, but it's just, that's too attenuated, right? They, they came up with some kind of crazy, crazy thing. That was probably lobbied by somebody, uh, you know, like, look, it's either signed by the judge or it's not, right? Um, so uh, yeah, and that, that's pretty much the standard. That, so what a lot of uh, folks opt into is either dealing with that, um, those hurdles um, and getting, if, if they're gonna play the non-judicial route um, or, or maybe they've found ways to work around it well enough um, or maybe even dividing up their portfolio and saying, hey, I'm going to take this portion isn't really worth a whole lot. Maybe I'll go the cheaper and faster route and go the non judicial route and kind of take, take the best I can with it. And they just kind of let me just try to get this sold to somebody. Maybe I can sell it to the next door neighbor or something like that and they won't matter. Um, but obviously the, the, the majority is on the other side and they got to look at, at, at you know, at, at carving out the, the portfolio for the judicial route because if it's more valuable and you know with, with title insurance and most of your listeners probably know what title insurance opens the door for or if you don't have it what it precludes financing right bank financing banks aren't sure as heck aren't going to touch it without title insurance uh and if you take financing off the table as being an option for this property post deed is you're not only you're you're not only reducing what you can do with that property which benefits the property itself and the community etc but the value of, of what you have, right? Um, because most value from a tax deed property that's been out of the system for five, six years is probably going to come to do with renovating it, right? Right, bring adding value to the to the collateral, um, and uh, either you're going to have to come out of pocket because you can't get a bank loan. Um, and why would somebody want to come out of pocket on a property that the private industry won't touch? But, I mean, the, the insurance industry won't touch, right? So now right. you're going to have to, you have to actually like increase your your personal risk on something that has been deemed risky by the baseline, the standard of, the, of, of determining risk, which is the insurance. Right? <laughs> so it seems like a counterintuitive, right? So, you know, again, okay. it, it's not a good system. And, and, um, and um, now that the Supreme Court in Louisiana has acknowledged the, the, the process itself, it followed, is absolutely constitutional, is, and, and, and is, is a good workable system that protects everybody's rights. You're starting to see things open up in Louisiana. And this is what we're really excited about. We're starting to see insurance companies saying yes. We're starting to see um, more cases being decided in favor of the tax sale purchaser. And not because it's one-sided, because it's fair. Because it's fair. Because they can't get to that win unless they've given the people their rights, right? So it, it is a good system. It is a workable system. And I'm talking about from a very balanced standpoint. What you're starting to see is the rest of the industry take notice of this and say, like, wait a minute. I mean, I mean, insurance companies are here to make money, right? I mean, they don't want to turn down cases because they are, you know, job business. Um, they're obviously, we all know that they're here to take the premiums and never pay claims, right? That's their number one goal. So, so this is a great way. If there's a perception of risk, but there isn't really a risk, they can clean up, right? They can start saying, hey, look, and you know, and, and that was uh, the premise behind um, you know, U.S. National Title Insurance Company, which came on the scene in 2016 to ensure the Louisiana tax deed sales was like, we got this. Like, we understand this risk uh, because we're we're you know we're micro analyzing it, and we have a system that makes sure that uh, there's checks and balances and filters, and, and and nothing can get through without it meeting a certain level of risk that's that's insurable. And so, if we know the system, and we trust the system, then we're going to insure that property. Well, the same kind of premise applies in the judiciary, right? If you trust the system that everything coming out of it has to have met a certain standard that you've already approved that process, then everything that's coming out of that process becomes an insurable risk, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it certainly has not been across the board and, and I'm not here to say that like, hey, every insurance company out there is, is carte blanche at this point on tax sales. That's by far not the case, but it is a dramatic improvement for where we were years ago. Uh, where even if you had in the, under the prior law and multiple years until 2017, even if you had a tax sale deed, a, a quiet excuse me, a quiet title judgment from a court, which we're calling is the gold standard, right? Right. But under the prior law, that could still be overturned. Oh wow! And which and so because it comes and it comes back to that that moment at the tax sale was notice provided before or after. Right. And everything, all this stuff you're telling me, even the court judgment happened after that violation occurred, it, it all gets erased. 
It doesn't matter if it's been 10 years since that court judgment was decided. It doesn't matter if they were served. It doesn't matter anything. It's done, right? Now, if you're an insurance company and you're looking at Louisiana, you're saying that, wait a minute, even the quiet title judgment doesn't protect me? Even, even the, 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 the time to wait out for an appeal has passed and I still have to worry about this? Like, yep, you have to worry about it forever. <laughs> forever. Now, please come into our state and insure these properties, right? Yeah. That's, it, and, and, and as a matter of fact, that's when I started practicing in tax sale law in Louisiana. So it was a fun time. Um, uh, and, and, and it was, but it really forced us to think of creative ways to work around that and provide because it didn't stop tax sales from occurring. It didn't stop people from investing in tax sales. But obviously, that's a really good investment, right? Uh, people just found workarounds. You know, let's let's go get title insurance through this place, or let's let's do extra work, or let's do workout plans. Let's figure out a way. Thankfully, now with the change of the law in '09, the acknowledgement of it by the by the, the highest courts in the land, um, Louisiana has currently. I think, and I argue in my paper, it's one of the best systems in America. Um, it, it is certainly is one of the highest interest rates. Um, and if you can get I mean, cumulatively, right? If you're talking about 31% over three years. And if you can get over the, the, the complexity hurdles, which working with somebody who's an expert in the field would help, um, shameless plug, uh, you know, then, then uh, obviously uh, that's something that, that, that gives you an advantage in a state that actually is valuable is very balanced, is insurable, and you've only you just you've just gotten over that last hurdle, which is the complexity of it. You know, so anyway, that's that's uh, that's kind of where we are now, and obviously leading is a segue into the 2021 law change proposal. Uh, it's like, well, if you're so good now, what do you what, what are you still doing tinkering with it? You know, like <laughs> let it be already. You know, <laughs> well, we can't let good enough alone apparently in Louisiana. So um, we still have obviously some very important things to fix. And the bid down of ownership percentage is outdated and doesn't need to be there any longer. Uh, we need, we need, we really should change that. Um, and the biggest, uh, I say oversight, but I understand why. The 2009 committee, that's what well, became the 2009 law. The committee didn't go down the road of changing the constitution. Um, obviously, constitutional changes are way more onerous and, and more difficult to get done. Um, and the if you can get statutes passed without touching the constitution it's the path of least resistance right and, right and that's exactly what they did and i'm thankful that they did that because it actually they, it was so well written that despite there being no change in the constitution which currently appears to conflict with the statute and what's happening at the tax sale um that it was upheld right so so i'm glad they did that but it needs to be changed it, it is literally the constitution says that we're selling property Got it. So don't and obviously, we've gone through great lengths in statute to say, no, we're not. We're <laughs> not uh, but uh, like, wait a minute, doesn't the Constitution outrank the statute? Like, well, actually, all that matters is what you did, right? It's like, like, you can say, do this, but what, they, what if they're not actually doing that? You know, they're not really selling the property. They're only selling a lien. They're selling the government's lien in this property. So in actual practice, every tax collector in the state is not following the Constitution. Hmm. But anyway. <laughs> In a really, in a really good way. So let, let's make sure that they're not violating the constitution every every single time. And let's just go ahead and change the constitution to be what it is we're actually doing. <laughs> well, um, not to add complexity back into what we we're hoping to uh, um, uh, reduce the complexity, um, but it sounds like there's you know some good changes come down the pipeline. Um, I'm gonna kind of circle back a little further back in the process um, and, and then we'll kind of call it good for today, Stephen, if that works for you. But, um, you know, this all assumes every lien sells. So I guess um, what happens to those liens that that don't sell at auction? Um, you know, is there the ability to actually purchase those liens from the county? Yeah, I'll say over the counter is what we call it, you know, directly from the county uh, after the fact. Um, or are they forced to, you know, put them back in auction? Um, and then ultimately, if, if it never sells, what happens to those liens down the road? Can you describe that a little bit for us as well? Yeah, actually, I can. And that's really why uh, what brought me to the civic source was that exact um, subject. And, uh, and, and what I had the good fortune of being a, a part of the um, a very positive change. Uh, the 2009 statutory change uh, provided a process for those that the exact type of property you just described um, to be 
return to commerce, have a, a way for it, investors to, um, to to obtain those um, and, and have it and have it clear the hurdles of um, legal due process and clearing title and transferring ownership. Um, the, in Louisiana, it's it's a, it's referred to as adjudicated properties. Um, mm -hmm. which they could I think they could have found a better word than that, but uh, that's what they went with. Um, and uh, uh, it also has a dual meaning in law. Something that's adjudicated means it's just been ruled on, right? So it's um, um, by by a court. But anyway, um, it, tax ta unsold tax deeds, adjudicated property. That's what Louisiana calls it. Um, so. The government that puts the tax lien in the sale this is the way it works, um, and it, it gets no bids. Um, obviously, you failed to sell. Um, what they were trying to do, so you understand, can you wrap your mind around what's not happening, what is happening, because there's many misconceptions about this too. Government does not then become the owner of the property. The owner of the property is still the owner of the property. All the government was attempting to do at the tax sale was to sell its lien in the property to another person. That sale never occurred, right? So the government was just still holding its lien that it held before that failed sale. There is a process, or there's a certificate actually first called an adjudication certificate that memorializes that that failed sale occurred. That's the meaning of that for the most part. Now it has some other it has some other consequences. Um, the other consequences are it starts the ticking of time. Well, once once that adjudication certificate has been filed record saying that the lien didn't sell. Uh, it starts the running of the same three-year period as if it had sold. So the same three-year period that an investor would have for, for to wait out, right? To wait out for redemption to occur, can't take the property, can't take any foreclosure steps. You just got to sit back and wait. The government has the same um, waiting period as well before they can opt in to do certain other things. Can anybody buy the lien from the government? in that time period? No. Okay. No, no, the government has a choice to put it back into another tax sale okay. or, or adjudicate it. Okay. Well, let's do. Um, so the, 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 the only kind of payment that can happen during that three-year period is to literally pay off the tax sale, the, the adjudication, okay. right? And any kind of redemption or, or, or payoff of the adjudication is simply gonna revert the title back to where it was prior to the tax sale. So you're just gratuitously paying someone's taxes if you do that. Um, um, so the three years passes, same same three year period uh, from the time that the adjudication certificate is recorded from the same three year period as if it was a tax sale, and then the government has the that's what that's what triggers the eligibility for this process that I, that I, I refer to this process of selling adjudicated property. Okay. Um, minimum of three. Too much into that because I know that's a whole another segment. Um, but yeah, let's get us to at least the point where that process starts. Ab yeah, absolutely. So w once it's either three or they can wait out five years. And again, that just shortens the waiting period from six months to 60 days, just, just as in the tax sale world. The government can essentially go through a, a, a process to put the property up for sale, uh, conduct their own due diligence, um, and, and send out a final round of notices. This is very akin to the non-judicial route for the investor. If you kind of just think about that as being the, the, the concept, we talked about the non-judicial route to, for, to, to convert to a deed for an investor. That's pretty much what the government has re is required to do as well in this post-redemption, it's post re quote unquote redemption period. And then once they're finished that and they've waited out the requisite period, they can put it into an auction and sell it to the highest bidder. But now they're selling the property. They're actually selling the, the 100%. There's no bid down of interest. I mean, there's no bid down of ownership percentages. They are, this is like the last resort of tax collection, right? They tried everything else. They've even put it into a tax sale. The tax sale didn't even work, right? So now we're just sort of like, okay, I mean, so we've, we've got to help the public and we've got to get this property back into commerce. So there's, they are selling the property, but rem remember, according to the statute, they're selling it after due process has been had because that non-judicial um, um, process mandates that it be done. So, so um, it's being done, it's being done and then it's put into an auction and the highest bidder wins the property. Uh, and these pro and, and the, there's no mandate for the government to have these options. They can do it if they want to. They just can't do it earlier than three years. Okay. Um, and uh, and then you know, but they can. All, there's also some routes where they can they can sell it to the next door next door neighbor has first right refusal and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it is a whole other topic because because the the level of complexity it just it, it increases when you talk about adjudicated properties. 
yeah. uh, <laughs> the the risk increases um, uh, for from a title risk. Um, so you know, do, trying to do it on your own rather than going through a service um, or going through a government entity that has hired a service. Um, you know, these are all um, very very important, even more so with adjudicated properties. Um, um, because remember the, the sale failed to happen. You never had an investor get involved and, and maybe like, like in the central properties case, if someone who was knew what they were doing and sent out the right notices that never happened. Right. And now you're relying on a government entity to have done it correctly. And you know, you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really important to be, but, but there's, but you, again, the, the distinction there is now we're talking about the hundred percent of the real estate bid up premium. Uh, like a, like a true tax deed state would be. You're still, the government's selling that property. Got it. Okay. Well, we'll we'll dive into that another day. Um, I I I think we've covered um, probably even more than than I think a lot of folks were were hoping to get out of this, which has been amazing. Uh, appreciate it, Stephen. Thanks for for joining us and thanks for all of your amazing insight. Um, I wish you the, the best of luck with, with Juris Deed. I, that'll be a, a game changer in the industry uh, by far. Um, and hopefully we are able to connect again sometime soon. We'll talk about adjudicated properties um, and go from there. Sounds Thanks great. Again. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks, thanks so much for having me in this opportunity to, to share with your listeners um, um, what Louisiana has become. Uh, surprisingly uh, to most people, it, it's, it's a lot better than, than probably um, you may have thought, uh, and, 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 you know, for good reason, uh, that have been thought that in the past, but a lot has changed and it's a, it's a pretty exciting time to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, I've, um, I learned a lot. I read the paper. I, I, you know, I've been in the industry for 12 years, um, and, and typically understand how processes work pretty well, but I, I tell you what, over the last you know hour and a half or so, I've, I've learned an immense amount of, of new information. So thanks again. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right.